to The Writing Life, interviewing real writers about making a living from their words. Hi, this is The Writing Life. I'm Kitty and I'm here with Ines. Hi. And today we're talking to Paul Atherton, the published author of Viking Voices, and currently working on another historical novel set in World War II called Billy's War. If you could read some of your work for us now, that would be great. OK, this is an extract from my, uh, the novel I'm working on at the moment, which is called Billy's War. Leon Sumer, 6th of June, 1944. Three hours, Billy. Three bleeding hours been under this lorry. Yeah, Jack, and so what? Even if we stuck on the beach, we're alive. That's already three hours longer than I'd expected to live, I replied. How long are we going to stay under here? The war will be over by the time we stick our heads out. There's no point in getting out until we know it's safe, mate. We've only been in the war three hours and you've forgotten your bloody training already. It's cold, wet, and in case you've forgotten, they're not bloody potatoes sitting above our heads. That's two tons of high-explosive shells. We're not safe here. It's a damn sight safer than out in the open. In Tilbury, they told us the commandos would clear the Germans away from the beach, but after the reception we've got, we know that's bollocks. Those buggers never did their job. But it's been three hours and all quiet since then. The Jerrys must have gone by now. Well, you stick your head out then, smart ass, and if you're so bloody sure, I'm staying here. It's not safe here. The tides come in and we'll drown soon. I looked down under the lorry along the beach towards the sea and my heart sank. Those little white waves were distinctly closer than when we got off the landing craft. We'd crossed just 200 yards before the tirade of sh- sh- uh, bullets pulled us up and we all took cover. It looked much less than that now. Jack had a point. I wasn't going to concede that now, so I just kept quiet. The craving for a ciggy was strong. Could he have lit up under the vehicle? My trainee said no. No one smokes under the petrol or, around petrol or ammunition. Neither of us spoke for a while and it started to rain. The breeze was stronger, strong enough for some of the rain to find its way in in spits and spats into our face, completing our misery. Thanks for that, Paul. So, Paul, you say that you are an admirer of the Vikings as sailors and you yourself are an amateur sailor. Why is the water so inspiring to you? Um, I think that it's always a great thing to go sailing because it always feels dangerous um, <laughs> and hopefully it isn't but it always feels as though there's an element of danger in it whatever you, you feel on the water there's always something different happening uh, water's supposed to be inanimate and yet you find that it's actually got many moods especially the sea, the Irish sea in particular it can be um, a wonderful, pleasant experience to sat in nice warm sunshine and calm waters but it can equally be a terrifying experience when you find yourself in cold, wet, heavy wind, big seas. So it's it's a strange thing, water. It's it's inanimate, and yet it seems to have a life. So do you think you could turn an experience you have sailing into a story? To a certain extent, I have in in Viking Voices, because Mm -hmm. um, I describe a lot of movement of the Vikings around the Irish Sea. Um, so I draw a lot from my own experience oh. of serving there at sea and that. So I know where they're going to go. So when they leave Dublin, I know they'll get to Anglesey first. When they leave Anglesey, I know they're going to mm. go to the Isle of Man, or it's one of the options anyway. I also describe a sea battle around the Isle of Man, oh. which draws upon my knowledge of tidal currents around the island um, and the specific geography of, of the place as well. So you've worked along with a publishing house to self-publish Viking Voices. How was that? Can you talk to us a bit about that process? Um, it's very easy to work with self-publishers because they're very non-judgmental, mm. um, but they also don't give you any advice or help. So you're left very much to your own devices. You have your own editor, and you can basically do what you like. I mean, some nice things about it, like you get a big say in the design of the cover. You get to say, you know, how the thing appears. It becomes very much your own creation, the, the, the entire book. Uh, on the other hand, if you're making mistakes, you don't know that you're making mistakes. Mm. So why did you decide to self-publish rather than go through more traditional routes? I spent quite a little bit of time trying to contact publishers mm-hmm. and got very little response from them. I then went the route of trying to contact literary agents and didn't find that that was 
particularly satisfactory either. Mm. Um, I found a lot of people didn't respond at all. Mm -hmm. um, and if they did respond, you got what, what looked like very much a standard letter saying things like, very nice, but it's not our kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I never found the, the people who wanted to work with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I was determined to publish, so I just went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah, brilliant. And I know that you go to festivals to promote your work and even dress yourself as a Viking. I mean, I think this is great, like when an author gets involved in the marketing of his own work. So what marketing strategies would you say are being more useful for your book? Well, I actually quite enjoy the commercial mm. aspect of it. I know a lot of authors don't want to do it, but I quite like it. So I've found certain things to work quite well for me. Like I've built up a good relationship with some castles, oh. like Lancaster Castle, and particularly yes. the Lancas Lancashire Museum. Um, in Preston, so they're selling my books. I've got quite a good relationship with Northwest Libraries, so I've done three or four presentations within the libraries. I've, I've also been to the Viking Festival at York, that went particularly well. Waterstones, so I did a mm. signing at Waterstones, so that went well. So I'm, I'm, I then found that apart from York's the big Viking Festival, and there isn't really another one, but Largs in, in Scotland on the Clyde is a, something very similar but they don't have really a literary event to, to go with it, or at least they didn't. I uh, got quite involved with blogs, and they are now going to have a literary event. Mm -hmm. So I've, uh, I've, I've played my part in setting up the, the meet the author aspect of the Largs Viking Festival. So that's been very satisfactory. So how does it work? Like, you just approach these people saying, well, I have published this book. Would you help me? But generally, I offer some help, if you like. I offer to participate. I offer to do okay. a presentation. Um, I like doing presentations. Mm -hmm. I like having an audience. <laughs> um, and especially if I've got a nice, well-prepared presentation that I can run through. Yeah, so that I know I'm saying the same thing every time. I know which jokes people are going to laugh at and which they're not going to. So <laughs> you, can, uh, you can amend your little bit of banter with the audience. So yeah, I really enjoy doing the presentations. And you find a lot of libraries and a lot of uh, the, the festivals actually welcome people to come and do the speaking. So the presentations you're doing, are they educational presentations? Are they speaking about the historical period you've written about? Or? I actually prepared two. So one was about the experience of being an author mm -hmm. and one was about the history. Like, there's no doubt the history one goes down far better. Mm. Um, so that's the one I've tended to, to use now. Inevitably, although it's, you know, it's, historic, it's a, a presentation about Viking history, it has lots of excerpts from my book in it. Ah, so the two we've are, weaved them in. <laughs> the two are interwoven, yeah. And have you ever thought about going down the route of teaching as a, a means of sustaining your writing life? I've not really considered that yet. No. Mm -hmm. Do you write every day or follow any kind of routine with your writing? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't have any routine at all. Basically, mm -hmm. I write when I feel like it. <laughs> there's certain disciplines you've got to impose on yourself but uh, like if you find you've not written for a week you know there's a problem so you've just got to force yourself to do it but most of the time I do it when I feel like it it seems to work reasonably okay does it happen often then? does it happen every day or no, no they definitely go I can go several days without writing and feel okay but I do, what I do feel what I do find is that there are times when I can write a lot so, you know, there's days when I can knock out 4,000 words. You know, it makes up to a certain degree mm -hmm. for the days that I don't. And so you've um, completed your MA in Creative Writing at Lancaster University. How would you say that's influenced um, your writing routine when you've had those days where something just hasn't come? Has there been more pressure? <laughs> well, within the, the MA itself, I mean, the, it's timetabled. So inevitably you have to produce 1,500 words uh, a week. For that, and so of course during during that period, I've had to accept the timetable and make sure that I worked when when it was needed to. It hasn't always been comfortable. There's times when I've produced work when, if you like, the news is not coming, mm -hmm. and uh, I I don't feel as though I'm writing as well as I'm capable of mm -hmm. because I'm being forced into a timetable. But most of the time, it seemed to work reasonably well. I think. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that makes you more productive? Writing in a specific hour of the day, or drinking coffee, or eating something special? What I do need is I need to go somewhere very quiet, oh, okay. on my own, 
so that I can lock myself away with just a laptop. Um, <laughs> so that's definitely one thing that, 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 that I need. Um, I find that I'll work far better in the mornings. Mm, interesting. Um, and if there's anything that helps me, it might be black, black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how do you balance personal and work life with your writing? Uh, yeah, it's definitely been an issue for me because... Uh, yeah, I have to put aside a day every week to make sure that you know, my wife and I go out for a trip mm. somewhere. Um, tends to be Lytham uh, <laughs> or Silverdale, somewhere by the coast. Um, but certainly we make sure that we put some time aside for, for ourselves. There are times, like I said earlier, that there are times I go a week without writing. There are also weeks when I will write every day. Mm. Um, but however, you know, we've got to balance life. So you're coming to, to writing later on in your life, but you've always had ambitions of, of being an author. Um, so when would you say you started seriously thinking of yourself as a writer? Uh, well, not yet, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have published a book, you have another book on the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I guess I wanted to write and therefore I wrote a book. And after that, I decided I need to learn to write. <laughs> You think about it logically, you should really do it the other way around. Um, so now that I've, I feel that I have learned a lot more about writing, I, I probably rewrite the first book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll, I mean, at some point I'll be producing work that I'm satisfied with, but I'm not yet at that stage. I think most, most authors go through that. They won't even dare look at their first published novel because yeah. they're so cringed out by it. So you're not alone, I'm sure. So would you say like the masters in creative writing at Lancaster University has helped you? Like it's an experience you would recommend to other people? Um, it's definitely helped me. It changed my writing quite a lot. I mean, my uh, style and my ide ideas about writing are, are dramatically different. There's certain things that I was doing before that I didn't know mm. whether it was right or wrong, and now I know it's wrong. So um, yeah, there's plenty of things that I can do far better now. So the project you've been working on during the MA was inspired by the life of your father. Was it difficult to fictionalise someone so close to you? Um, well, it certainly had some anxieties in it because when I found that people didn't react well to um, the personality that I was writing for him, um, it, uh, it felt a bit... and you think something had gone wrong. Mm. It wasn't the personality that I was trying to portray. So I presume you do a, a lot of research for your historical fiction. Where do you usually go to do it? Do you travel to the places you're writing about or is it more library and internet based? What's the um, process? It depends on the... the well, the two, diff two different projects that I worked on have, have produced different kinds of research. So with the Vikings, it's pretty well all reading. Mm -hmm. Pretty well all reading. There's very little on the internet that you can use. You can, I mean, I've been to York, I've been to Dublin, mm. I've seen what's in the museums there. The only other thing that I've done apart from reading for the Vikings was talking to people in the museums, you know, like the historians themselves. And you do get quite a lot of interesting stuff from them. For the Second World War, it's completely different. There's a huge amount on the internet. Um, and, you know, there's a, a, a website called British Forces in Palestine, which I drew a lot from. And it's got individual stories. It's got photographs, it's got all kinds of things in it. So for the Second World War, I've used the net a great deal. Very, well, I've done some reading as well, um, but it's been much more focused on, on web stuff. Uh, what I haven't done so much is travel to different places. You know, certainly um, I've not been to Germany, I've not been to, I've, I have actually been to the D-Day landing beaches, but I've not been to Palestine either. And to be honest, I don't think it matters whether you go to those places or not. You don't get that much from seeing the place in 2015 that will tell you what it was like in 1944. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's all done by it's done by different ways. So you can't talk a lot. A lot of it's talking to people. Certainly with Billy's War, I spoke a lot to my my siblings, my brothers and sisters, because they remembered snippets of things that my dad had told them that I didn't know about. Mm. Um, although in fact, it, I found out he talked to me more about it than anybody else actually. Mm. But even so, I know, like because of your job, you have travelled all over the world. That inspired you in some way. All those places you have visited. 
I mean, there was a time when he did, you know, I wrote a lot about travels, um, but I haven't retained any of it, because <laughs> at some point I became very dissatisfied with what I've written. So, yeah, there was lots of times when I wrote as I travelled, mm. talking about myself as a traveller, oh, okay. um, but certainly um, I don't have any of that left. I didn't retain it, I didn't, I didn't think it was good enough. It's uh, hard when you have to balance real things that you've experienced or seen with turning it into fiction, and I think that's something really hard when you're doing historical fiction in particular. So how do you balance it between the real-life facts and the fictional story that you want to put across? I think the way I p- produce the story is that I research the history, and the history gives me the story. So I then draw from uh, experiences of life, ideas, people's thoughts, uh, other reading, and I fit them into the story. But the story is from the history, so it's a framework, if you like. I use the history as a framework. Um, you know, I don't ever want to write things that are historically incompatible with what really happened. So the, the, the knowing the historical facts is very, very important. If I can then describe a place in, as, as I've seen it, then that may be helpful, providing I would be confident that what I've seen in 2015 is a representation of what it would have been like at whatever time I was describing it. Uh, actually, when I did the, the story about Palestine, I used Google Street View quite a lot. So I looked at places. Of course, it gave me a reasonably modern view of the, those mm. places. So you have to try and discount what is in that that wouldn't have been there in 1946. Mm. But it gives you an idea of the countryside, gives you an idea of the, uh, the forest, whether it's forested, whether it's agricultural land, whether it's hills. So you can get quite a lot from, from actually Google Street View is very useful for, for Palestine. Mm. So something that's happened to me when I've been writing historical fiction is I'll write something that I've researched and know to be historically accurate, but somebody's called me up on it and said, would that really have happened? I don't believe it. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> and, and how do you deal with that? Well, th- this is something that happens to all of us, but I think you've got to, you've got to rely on the idea that truth is stranger than fiction. Mm. But fiction... Yeah cannot be stranger than truth, otherwise it's just strange. (laughs) So, yeah, if you're writing something that is unbelievable, frankly, you have to change it, even if you know that that's the truth. Uh, And I draw a lot from little stories that I find on the internet where you say, you know, it's a story of somebody's experience who was in Palestine, if that's what you're talking about, at the time, and they had this experience. And it would have been, I mean, the reason why they write it about it, normally because it's something quite peculiar. But if you adopt that into your book, you have to be confident that it will sound convincing um, in the context of, of a fictional novel. And how do you balance the historical facts and the narrative when you are writing? I know one of the particular challenges that I found was that at the point where I was researching the liberation of Belson, mm. for example, you find a great deal of information about it, but it's from the point of view of a historian. So the historian knows everything. They know what the generals were thinking, they know mm. what the generals of both sides were thinking, they know all the strategy that was involved, they know the negotiations that were going on. The guy who I'm describing is um, a driver mechanic mm. in a lorry on the ground. He wouldn't know anything about the strategy. Yeah, so you have to limit it to that mm. view Um, and you have to think through what would it be like to be there and a lot of what you read in terms of history is then actually misleading there are things that he would not know that were were going on he wouldn't know for example that there had been a treaty drawn up between the Germans and the British that they were going to hand over Belson And, and as I describe it he doesn't know that and he goes in there in the second wave, in fact, it doesn't know anything about that. So there's lots of history that has actually got to be discarded from when you put it into the novel. You have to be very careful, especially when you're using a first-person perspective, to make sure you're only saying the things that that person could possibly have seen. Mm, thanks. I think that's really an advice. So does, does that come out more at the editing stage rather than the drafting stage, or is it something you're aware of when you, you do your first draft? Uh, no, I'm aware of it from the point of view of doing the first draft. Uh, I sit and think for, you know, and for quite a <laughs> while as to what, what is conceivable, what isn't. Um, I think my draft tends to be... first draft tends to be the story. 
Mm. The editing tends to be taking out all the errors. Yeah. Mm. So from those stages, drafting and editing, what do you find more challenging? I think I find the editing more challenging because mm. the, the, the drafting, the first write the story is fun. It's enjoyable. It's, you know, mm. it's, that's, that's the hobby bit of the, the job. Okay. And the editing is the work. You know, it's where you've got to make sure, have you got the tenses consistent? Um, have you put commas in the right places? <laughs> you should be using a semicolon here. All the, the nitty gritty things of writing that I always get wrong on the first draft. Uh, it's not fun putting them right, but if you're going to produce a polished version, then of course you've got to edit and re-edit and you know, change it several times. And also you worked in human resources for a long time, so I guess you, get, you got the chance then to meet a lot of different people. So was, was this good for you as a writer? Like, did it help you to create characters? For sure, mm -hmm. when I write about the Vikings, <laughs> um, there's lots of the people from the steel industry who fit straight into <laughs> those kind of characters. So yeah, I do draw um, experience of people I've met, you know, like um, particular, when I wrote about the Viking King, mm -hmm. I think of the guy who used to be our um, director of steel trading. Mm -hmm. So um, very, um, what should we call him, very bluff, a uh, robust Yorkshire man who must have been a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a previous life. So you also had to write a lot of reports for your job. And did that kind of writing influence the artistic style you had to use during creative writing course? Um, well, it created the impression that I was a good writer. Um, my business reports were fairly well appreciated because they were simple. You know, they were... They were condensed right down. I'd write the report and then I'd rewrite it, taking out all the adjectives, taking out the qualifying words, thinking of, I've used two sentences here, will one do? So condensed it very much. And you used to get a very dense text so that you know, the meanings were, were very clear. Um, I would use some jargon in it, but they were always explained. So, you know, I, I, they, it was a very simple style of writing. Um, when I started writing literature, um, I, quite wrongly as it turned out, decided to reverse it. So I threw in adjectives and adverbs all over the place. <laughs> and, um, you know, had masses of description, which I now know is um, perhaps not the, quite the right way. The truth is somewhere in the middle. But also, um, now that I'm writing literature, you need to add action and drama. Action and drama wasn't any part of the, uh, the, the, the business reports. So they are very different, but they're each got certain amounts. The consistency and the common ground is that you've got to be very clear in what you're saying and make it accessible to the reader. So you write about the Vikings who lived in Lancashire centuries ago and also about your own family. Do you need to feel close to what you write about? Because you are always writing somehow about looking back at the source. So is that essential to you as a writer? Yeah, it is. I, I do need to feel the connection. I, feel, I have to be interested in what I'm writing. Mm. So, um, yeah, having a history that is in some way connected to me yeah. is important, yes. Because otherwise, I just wouldn't have the... I don't think I've had the motivation to write it. But is it, I mean, what I mean is, like, it's especially connected to you. You are writing about where you come from, in a way, right? Because Vikings were in Lancashire first, and you are from Lancashire. You're writing about your father. I mean, it's especially it's a strong, a really, really strong connection. Right? Yeah, you're right. In both cases, there's a personal connection. That's it, right? Yeah. Um, because I actually believe I have a theory that <laughs> um, you know a lot of the population of Lancashire, central Lancashire is descended from the Vikings, because the Vikings mm. came, you know, a thousand years ago, they never went home again. Oh. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> so you're living in Preston at the moment, and how is the literary life there? Well, I haven't really made the connection with the literary life in uh, Preston. I think there is a writer's group. Um, I'm certainly thinking very carefully now about um, what I'm going to do over the next year, because I can't afford to be disconnected from a writer's group. The, the experience of the last year has proved that if you have feedback from other people, then you end up with a better product, a yeah. far better product, than what you can produce on your own. There are things that you can't see because you're too close to the writing. Once you've written it, you think it's right. Mm. Whereas other people can tell you, uh, you know, where it's not having the effect that you wanted. And even they can produce ideas about how to add to it 
Uh, so that's something that's happened to me about four or five times this year where people have suggested you've missed an, an opportunity for some drama here mm-hmm. and we end up, instead of one chapter, you end up with two or three. Mm-hmm. And that's massively helpful in what you're doing. Definitely, you think that gathering with a group of writers is very useful then for you to grow as a writer. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, we're already talking about I know that there's a number of people talking about having a Cumbrian writers group, mm. which is composed of people who've attended this, this programme. So I'm interested in being part of that group. So what's your next big project after this Masters? Uh, well, I've, I've got several projects to wow. finish now. <laughs> uh, I guess um, in my list of my, my priorities in mind is that I'm you know, halfway through Billy's War, so I want to complete it. Mm. Uh, so that would be the next one. Uh, I probably want to have another look at Vi- the Viking Voices book that I produced, because uh, I haven't given up on the Vikings, but uh, I think I'll still go back to that. I might well want to publish a second edition of it, wow. which would be, you know, if you like, incorporating my learning from Lancaster into the first book. Part way, I started on a sequel to it, which was also part of my work with Lancaster. I'm sure mm. I can write that far better now than um, than I could at the beginning of the the program. So that might be the second. Um, I may well then write a play because wow. that was part of my thinking in the first place. So the the Viking project should be two novels and a play. Oh, a Viking play. A Viking play. That sounds really interesting. So then I'd put on the Viking play at all the festivals. Wow, yeah. And um, give everybody a discount on <laughs> buying the books. It's <laughs> a great strategy. Yeah, it's very original. Viking play. Yeah. I don't think there is something like that, right? Mm. Around, so wow. <laughs> The only problem is that um, my first attempts at writing the play weren't a complete success, but never mind, I'm sure I could do better now. <laughs> For your novels, you actually use a, a pen name so people might not immediately find you. It's Vincent Atherton. What, what's the reason behind that? Well, because I want to write about several different periods of history, um, I think I might confuse people if I'm writing... Like I'm writing about Vikings one minute and then about the Second World War next. So I'm going to present myself as... I'm marketing myself in a different way. So Vincent the Viking <laughs> and Paul from all of the periods. I, I guess from the first book when I published it, I also had certain reservations about how good a book it was in the first place. So I protected my... <laughs> name by using a pseudonym. This That's is my real name. I, I mean, it's my second name, which I yeah. very rarely use. So, with your with your first book about the Vikings, you were focusing on a very specific audience, like people who are the Vi- who like the Vikings. Like, so, do you always pick an audience before writing the story, or was this just coincidental? No, it's completely the other way around. I decide, you know, I look for the story. Okay. Um, and having found the story, um, I then figured out whether there's an audience. In fact, there's quite a big audience for Viking stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but that's an accident. <laughs> so, um, okay. you know, in, commercially, I think the Viking genre has got quite a lot of legs. And mm-hmm. especially if I can persuade other Viking festivals to take on a literary festival to go with it, as I've done with logs. I've got uh, one or two other places in mind where I might try and persuade them to have a meet the author event as well. You're writing about um, real historic periods, particularly in your second project. You're using aspects of real people's lives to inform the narrative. So does it affect your writing, having an awareness of, in a way, respecting those people in that period of time? It hasn't really, no. I haven't respected them at all. I've just written (laughs) what I feel. Um, So Mm -hmm. I I may well have to have a look at the text and the way I've presented it and uh, make sure Mm -hmm. I do not trample too heavily on the, uh, if you like, the the relatives of the people who, mm-hmm. who, are, who would otherwise be mentioned in that play. And do you think that's something that's important, or do you think when you're doing a creative piece of work it should just be the story first and foremost? You shouldn't have to worry about offending people or treading on people's toes. I think when you write the story, you've got to, you've got to concentrate on action and drama. I don't think you can, but you can afford at that point to think too heavily about other considerations. You know, it's like one job at a time. Mm. Um, however, before you publish it, you have to think through very carefully quite what effect you're going to have. 
Because at that point you can you can do other things like change the names is an obvious one, uh, which will allow you to you know not cause offence. I think part of my intention with all of these books though is to have a connection with place. So whether it's a connection with family or not is a different question, but certainly a connection with place. So the Viking book has a very strong connection with Preston because mm. it's the story of the Curedale Horde. Uh, that was found in the banks of the River Ribble. The Billy's Wars a very strong connection with with Lee, my, my hometown, uh, because it describes the people there, it describes places there, clearly it de- describes the people there. It, it also has a pretty strong connection with Palestine, and it's got a lot to do with modern politics, because uh, it is the origin of the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, and a lot of what is put forward in modern propaganda is incompatible with the origins of particularly the Israeli straight state. I would I would anticipate that you know if I do publish it, it'll be quite controversial and the Israelis will definitely not like it. Well it's been fascinating talking to you and hearing about your many different projects, um, particularly about um, the the Vikings and the World War Two novel. And so finally if you could just tell us where we can find your published work so our listeners can look you up. Well, you can, you can buy Viking Voices from pretty well every bookshop. Most of them will not have it in stock, I'm afraid, but they'll certainly <laughs> order it for you. You can buy it from Amazon, buy it online uh, from the publisher, Troubadour. Um, um, but it's also sold in, I mean, it's definitely in stock in Lancaster Castle. And, yeah, I have seen it there. <laughs> and, uh, and in the um, Harris Museum in Preston and the Museum of Lancashire in Preston. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So now Paul is going to give us another reading, um, the second part of his extract from Billy's War. Look at this, I'm going to get out and have a look, said Jack as he hauled his tall, skinny body out from under the vehicle, trying to peep out. I can't see a damn thing from here, too many vehicles around us. Where's that tea shop place they were shooting from? Jack crawled out from beyond the lorry and knelt up, pulling up the collar of his greatcoat to keep the wind out. He looked around but said nothing. Then he moved further away from the lorry and must have gained a view of the promenade. I scrutinised it and to my relief there was no sound. No sign that the Jerrys were still about. Jack looked around and was clearly relieved. There's no one on the beach, no one at all. No one on the promenade either. Promenade either. I think they've all got... I heard a soft, wet thwack and Jack rolled over onto his side and lay still. I could still see his face. A small red circle appeared in the centre of his forehead. His eyes... So agitated a moment ago, looked dull. His body was completely still. Jack, Jack, what's happened? Are you all right? I screamed and jumped up. I banged my head against the underside of the lorry. There was no reply. A stream of black red blood had started to seep from Jack's head, a dark pool on the golden sand. He's dead, I thought calmly. He can't be dead, I thought hysterically. Not Jack, my mate Jack, the big joker, the ever likely, ever laughing Jack the lad. He looked dead. His skin took on a waxy pallor. The posh boy from Oral had gone. All of that expensive education wasted. Ambitions and aspirations were lost. In the space of one word, he left this world. He was here for the girl, but the rest of the word was gone. I cowed back under the lorry, damp and cold and wet. Damn the rising tide, damn the high explosives. I was staying here no matter what Jack said. Jack said nothing, but his lifeless body alongside me told me eloquently that he was dead and I was going to die too. Every sinew and every nerve in my head tightened. The temples ached and I could barely breathe. Maybe I'd just choke to death and cheat the enemy that way. Fumbled with my flies to open before I pissed myself. My hands trembled so much I couldn't do it. I was too hot. I was too cold. I was too... Oh, who cares? I just couldn't do it. After a minute of rigid inaction, I concentrated on fumbling and looked away from Jack's body. I made a small, wet patch on the sand. You have been listening to The Writing Live. Now we want to thank Teresa, our editor, and Yvonne, the creator of the show.